Lee and I want to um, thank you all for attending what's really a very special book party uh, for Orville Shell. And hopefully many of you read, Eileen's going to be the, going to hold it up here. Many of you already have read or bought, started reading. Thank you, Mild, Eileen. Mild, Mild. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, hold them up if you've got the book. Thank you, Diane. Thank you. Oh, people all over the world, Orville, oh, yes. your book up. Look at that. That's terrific. And, and you were saying before, by the way, Peter and Susan Osnos are on that. Peter's the editor in your next project. So, so many of your friends are here. Um, but after all of his years as a China scholar, a leading journalist, and Emmy Award winning producer, former dean of the Berkeley Graduate School of Journalism, by the way, we were talking with, uh, uh, with uh, Ernie Wilson for a minute about the, the stresses of being a, a dean of a school these days in this financial time. Um, uh, and the director of the Center of U.S.-China Relations the Asia Society, and after writing 15 nonfiction books, this is Orville's first novel. And fittingly, it's dedicated to his late wife, Bai Fang, without whom Orville says in his beautiful dedication, I would never have fully become myself. Mm. Orville will be in conversation with Adam Hochschild, who is his literally his oldest friend. But Orville, I don't think he's been a friend for known each other as long as I've known you, but he's been your oldest true friend, which is true. <laughs> they first met in boarding school. Adam didn't want to say it was a boarding school, but it was, where they became friends and started working together. They're going to discuss looking at China through fact and fiction, a fascinating topic, I think. And Adam, of course, is himself one of the most celebrated journalists of our time, who's written several great books of nonfiction, including Ling, King Leopold's Ghost, which Ben Affleck hopes to turn to a feature film, and books on Russia and South Africa and the Spanish Civil War. And he's now writing a book about the, um, uh, the period um, right after um, or during, really, World War I. We want everyone to know that this conversation is being taped. Uh, and the tape will be posted maybe a few places, but we'll taste it, paste it on the YouTube channel by the USC Center on Communication Leadership and Policy, where I'm pleased to say that along with all those other zillions of titles, Orville is a senior fellow. There are some very, very well-informed guests in the room. You can see them around your screens. And we hope to bring them into the discussion at some point. And as I said, we want you to feel a little bit like this is a party, but we put everyone on mute as we start. After Adam interviews Orville for about 30 minutes, We'll be fielding questions through the Zoom's hand raising function. And a lot of you know how this works, but let me just remind you of how, because it'll make it much e easier for us to identify you. Please look at the bottom of your screen and you'll see a participants tab on the bottom of the screen. And when you click on that tab, a sidebar will appear that has a blue icon that says, raise your hand, which is among a, a list of other icons. If you do that, it makes it easier for us because you're your uh, question, you go to the, to the top of the screen for Adam to call on you. So that's a benefit for us. Um, Adam and two of my colleagues, Hannah and Alyssa, uh, will be monitoring raised hands and Adam will call on people to ask questions and to make comments. And of course, you also have the option of submitting questions through the chat room. And I should say that Sasha's son, that uh, uh, Orville's son, Sasha, is our videographer for this event, and we're very appreciative of that. With that background, please join me in congratulating Orville and welcoming Adam. Well, thank you, Jeff. And uh, thank all of you for uh, attending. Um, I feel I've got about three hours worth of questions for you. But uh, I want to set everybody's mind at ease by saying I'm not going to go on that long. Because uh, I want to talk about your book. But I also first want to talk about your very long time involvement with China and your fascination with China. And what drew you there? You know, uh, uh, people often knowing that we went to college together. Uh, often say to me, oh, that must have been uh, nice, you know, being around Orville then, but you were never there because you were always off in the Far East. Uh, I remember, I think it was your first trip, you worked your way across the Pacific as a cook on a freighter. Uh, so what drew you to that part of the world originally? Well, you know, I, uh, uh, at college, I s stumbled into a course, which is sort of a legendary course. I had no idea what I was getting into. Uh, and it met every day. It was a lot of reading. 
I was the one taught by John Fairbank and Edwin Reischauer. <clears throat> and um, then I got in the habit of studying in the, um, in the um, Harvard Yenching Library and seeing all these books and, and in Japanese and, and you know wondering uh, what they said. I think at that stage, being a college student, I, I just wanted to do something, you know, that was definitive and grand. So I decided, all right, I'm going to drop out, and I'm going to go out to uh, Asia, and then, then you could only go to Taiwan. You couldn't go to China and um, start learning Chinese. So I, I did that, and then I was sort of. It was once the snowball got rolling. It was very hard to get off it. So ever since I've been, you know, that's been something that I've really been fascinated by. So you learned the language a decade or so before it was possible to go to China itself. Yes, I didn't actually go to China until 1975. But um, actually, it was a really interesting moment because then, of course, Mao Zedong was still alive. Mm -hmm. And the Cultural Revolution still was going on. So I got a chance to, 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 to dip into it at that point and to see what it was like in its old revolutionary guise. Mm -hmm. And um, I have to say as well, that, 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 that was the moment when I began to, I mean, why write a novel? Mm -hmm. uh, I think it was because starting with that trip, there, I had so many more questions and was so much more confused when I got back than when I went. And I was writing for the New Yorker then, and I wrote mm -hmm. a, I don't know, a four-part series for them. But it was a total enigma to me. Why was it that you could go to this country, you could even speak some Chinese, and you couldn't make any friends with anybody? Mm -hmm. And of course, you've experienced this in Russia, the kind of the fearfulness with which people in such revolutionary societies confront foreigners. And that, that made me think, what is going on here? You know, what is missing from this equation? So your first trip was 1975, which was just what, a year or two after Kissinger and, and then Nixon went there for the first time, right? Yeah, it was about three years after, and we hadn't recognized China and, and you know, all over uh, uh, walls, chimneys, everywhere with things like, you know, down with American imperialists and their running dogs. It was still a relatively hostile time. Mm -hmm. And Americans were very much seen as, as you know, the, the avatars of capitalism, imperialism, colonialism, all of these words that Lenin had sort of uh, put on the, on the blacklist. Mm -hmm. So even though there was some sense we had to kind of get along and had to start converging. It was deep levels of suspicion. And then things began to change, right? What year did Mao die? Mao died in 76. Okay. And then it was within the next couple of years after that, that <clears throat> things really changed. How did you experience that? What are the, some of the things that loom largest for you in that next decade or so? Well, it, it, it was an incredibly interesting time. And I was in, writing for the New Yorker and sort of chronicling this, uh, this odyssey of this country to where nobody knew. Mm -hmm. But suddenly Deng Xiaoping appeared and he seemed as if he were some conjurer waving his magic wand to, to uh, sort of um, cancel mm -hmm. the whole or, or a good chunk of the revolution uh, that had preceded him. And it was so exciting because you couldn't tell whether this country was actually going to change or whether it was still so rooted in the past that it could never change. Uh, and, uh, uh, and in fact, as we've learned, a revolution doesn't simply vanish because one reformer comes along. We see that now. But those years were incredibly interesting years as China sort of came alive again after Mao. And uh, uh, it seemed to have the promise of exactly what came to be known as engagement. Mm -hmm. That if you work together, you give a little, you get a little, you have ballet companies, you have trade, you have journalists going back and forth, et cetera, et cetera. You may actually bend the metal of animosity mm -hmm. of the standoff that had divided us and slowly uh, create a, a, a more sort of, um, uh, you know, friendly, 
uh, environment. You mentioned earlier that, uh, you know, you couldn't make friends with people individually in that, that first trip and afterwards. Did that begin to change? late 70s, early 1980s? Yes, it yeah. did. I mean, I yeah. remember being totally flummoxed in the 70s yeah. uh, when I was there because everybody was so suspicious mm -hmm. and, and so standoffish because Americans had been so pitied by the party mm -hmm. as the arch enemies and the antichrists of mm -hmm. you know, counter-revolution and bourgeois society, et cetera, et cetera. And it was very confusing to be there then because um, uh, uh, you felt as if you were a, a, the most superficial form of tourist, mm -hmm. no matter how hard you, you tried to penetrate the, the society. You probably experienced a little of this in your trips to Russia where uh, until reform actually began, it was very hard to get under the society's skin. Yes and no. I think China was more extreme. Yeah. I think even during the, I mean, I'm, I'm too young to have been in Russia when Stalin was alive, when it well might have been different, when it was different, I think. But certainly during the long Brezhnev period, you could make friends with mm. people individually as long as it wasn't, uh, you know, too public. But China was more extreme that way, I think. I mean, I remember really, uh, and this was, I think, in the very early 80s, the first friend and a female friend at that mm -hmm. uh, I made and was sort of stunned by the fact by how open she was mm -hmm. and she was just a friend but uh, 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 a true friend and but it was electrifying at last to be able to break through the, the, mm -hmm. the kind of the veneer that had really divided the countries in such stark ways for so long. Mm -hmm. And then you were there just before the crackdown in Tiananmen Square, right? Yes, I mean, I, I, I was, uh, uh, my wife, Bai Fang and I went over very early after the demonstrations began and we were there for almost the whole period mm -hmm. and, and watched this extraordinarily sort of paroxysm of, mm -hmm. of popular energy, sort of upwelling of, uh, uh, you know, really was anti-communist, anti-Leninist, anti-revolution, all of these things. And of course, we all know how it ended. Yeah. Were you optimistic before the crackdown? You know, it was quite extraordinary to be in Tiananmen Square with a million people. Mm -hmm. And it was very peaceful. It was very friendly. It was mm -hmm. kind of ebullient mm -hmm. in a way which made it very, very difficult. Mm -hmm. to believe that something untoward would happen. And yeah. in fact, there was very little sign of the government for a long, long time. Oh. But then, of course, the worm turned and they decided this was getting out of hand and they called in the army. But the first time they brought the army in, the people just surrounded them and, and stopped them in their tracks. Mm -hmm. And that just really got Deng Xiaoping, I think, alarmed. Mm -hmm. So he called in units from all over the country. Mm -hmm. and sent them in heavy militarized, you know, with, with heavy armor and, and, and they weren't kidding around and then you, you know what happened. But that was a kind of an amazing moment in, in history and a, and a turning point, mm -hmm. the, the consequences of which we're still, uh, still witnessing. Yeah. I have a couple more questions about China and then I want to get to the book. Um, one of them has to do with how we talk to China. You have taken a remarkable assortment of Americans uh, to China. Uh, Yo-Yo Ma, Meryl Streep, Soros, uh, the dancer, Little Buck. Uh, and you've brought a remarkable number of Chinese here. Do you feel that in the current climate, those kinds of exchanges work, can loosen things up? Is there space for that to affect any change in China? Or is that not the right question to ask when it comes to this? No, I think it's a really apt question. And I think uh, the answer to that question, sadly, is that that presumption that we once, uh, I think, could uh, believe in, that bit by bit, things would changing for the better in China, becoming a little more open, a little more soluble in the world outside. All of these things have been largely ended by Xi Jinping. Mm -hmm. And so it's very hard now to believe in the idea of engagement, mm -hmm. which was the, the, the crux of everything we were doing for the decades before, because it doesn't seem that 
he wants to engage in the same way, and he certainly does not want the effects of what we imagined engagement would ineluctably mm. produce, namely, they would become less autocratic, less Leninist, and more soluble in the world outside. And that's not happened. Yeah. So we now have a situation, and, and Biden is wrestling with this, how do you approach China if engagement is dead? Mm -hmm. it, is the only possible relationship one of animosity and adversity? Mm -hmm. Yeah, certainly, and especially in a world where autocracy seems to be on the rise on almost every continent. Yeah. yeah. And in many ways, China under Xi Jinping is the avatar mm -hmm. because it's so successful economically mm -hmm. of a kind of a new form of sort of Leninist capitalism mm -hmm. that has some real signs of being effective. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. One more China expert question, and then I want to get to your book. Uh, we have a remarkable number of uh, influential and interesting uh, people on the call. I don't see Joe Biden there on the screen, but he well may, might be if you scroll <laughs> over to the side or something. If you had one piece of advice for him about dealing with China, what would it be? Well, you know, I find myself in this sort of incredibly odd situation now that um, I think they're doing pretty well, but this is early on. Mm -hmm. I think they're, uh, they recognize that there is a, a potentially hostile relationship brewing here and not to be naive, but they're not closing the door mm -hmm. to interaction. And I do think that under Xi Jinping, we are back to a, a curious sort of uh, uh, um, echo mm -hmm. of, the, of a cold war Mm -hmm. where it's a kind of system against system, mm -hmm. whereas after, uh, you know, the fall of the Soviet Union, we, th we, we thought, you know, the, the end of history, we thought everybody was sort of moving ineluctably in the same developmental direction. And now China has, has raised some big, put some big question marks over that presumption. Mm -hmm. They have designed and succeeded in affecting a quite successful form of Leninist capitalism. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, now I want to turn to your, your new book, the novel, My Old Home, uh, which I know you've been working on for many years. I remember mm -hmm. you started it more than 30 years ago. So even during that long stretch of time when you were writing New Yorker articles, articles elsewhere, uh, a ton of nonfiction books about China, you must have always had the feeling that there was something that you could only express in fiction that couldn't be expressed otherwise. Tell us about that. Yeah, I mean, it is curious what fiction can do that, I mean, you've written fiction, a nonfiction, Adam. Yeah. And I'm sure- I've unsuccessfully written a fiction. Well, but- uh, I mean, I have not written a lot of fiction, yeah. but I began to, to, to think that there were things about China you just couldn't get to mm -hmm. through nonfiction. God knows I tried, mm -hmm. but there are, there are questions about just sort of what human beings want, how human beings are, about uh, families, about religion, about uh, uh, you know other questions which are very difficult to get muddy very quickly in nonfiction. Does it have to do also with being able to imagine yourself into somebody's head in fiction, which of course, as nonfiction writers, we're not allowed to do because yeah. it all has to be footnoted. What's your source on that? Whereas in fiction, you you can and you have done so remarkably in this book. Imagined yourself into the head of this uh, young man who's your central character. Did that feel liberating? Oh, yes. I mean, because there were so many things that I couldn't really plumb mm -hmm. in nonfiction. And, uh, you know, I had a Chinese wife. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, I, I felt that, that the things that were really important, whether it's, you know, religion, mm -hmm. whether it's just, uh, people-to-people -people relations or personal relations. Uh, there were so many things that were very hard to get at through nonfiction. And I have to say the process of writing fiction was for me like um, 
having a sex change operation. I mean, mm. it was really hard uh, because every fiber in my body, like you, yeah, you write. What's your source on that? Wonderful yes, yeah, nonfiction, yeah. but I wager yeah. if you went off on the fictional track, you'd veer over the cliff a few times too. Mm. So it took literally decades to bend the metal to realize that you have to show, not tell, mm -hmm. and to develop characters that I hope are convincing. But I found there were so many things that I just couldn't talk about. I couldn't mm -hmm. express things dealing with religion, with interpersonal relations, with, uh, you know, um, just a myriad sort of human questions, mm -hmm. which are very hard to get at in, 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 uh, in nonfiction. Uh, take us through the journey of your principal character in the novel, Little Lee, without giving away too much about the psychological journey. Well, I thought what I would do is take a character who's a family of classical musicians, because it seemed to me that opened up a whole other realm of, of sort of human endeavor. Mm -hmm. uh, and happens to be a, a, a man who loves Bach, play, mm -hmm. plays the piano. So I thought, OK, we'll take this guy and we'll, we'll run him through the Chinese Communist Party sausage grinder and see what mm -hmm. happens. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I began to set off to try to tell that story that is more about people, even religion, sensibility, uh, what's important in life rather than simply the bottom line of revolution, which was, of course, the whole Maoist standard of success and failure. So I wanted to sort of plumb those other depths of, uh, you know, what really was going on in China besides just an old fashioned Marxist revolution? Mm -hmm. But because that did not seem to get to the question of any of the, the, the human questions that, that really interested me. I felt in reading this novel um, that in a way there was sort of a spectrum in it with Mao at one end and Johann Sebastian Bach at the other. <laughs> Yeah, I think you got it right, Adam. I mean, for me, I mean, what's Mao about? Yeah. Mao is about out there. Mm -hmm. Let's rearrange the furniture in the room. Mm -hmm. Let's have a revolution. And what's Johann Sebastian Bach about? He's about, let's look at ourselves. Let's look at our souls. Let's look at our relationship to God. Let's rearrange our own selves. Mm -hmm. Don't project it outward. Mm -hmm. So it seemed to me that actually, you know, the, the Bach Mao paradigm really says it all. And mm -hmm. so I wanted to plumb more the, the Bach side. So my heroes are a pianist and a, mm -hmm. and a flute player, and, and they, they come from, they're kind of hybrids. Mm -hmm. And I felt that, uh, you know, what's important in life? And here we get to some very different, different issues about what's important in a, in a communist revolution. It's all out there. Mm -hmm. it's, it's not in here in the sense that the, it focuses on the individual. It focuses on society and its mm -hmm. welfare. Mm -hmm. Take us through the plot a little bit, the young man and his father. Oh, well, it's 601 pages. We'll be here all night. I mean, it's really the story about uh, a, a deeply patriotic, loyal Chinese who is trained in America to uh, play piano and is also Christian mm -hmm. and goes back and is pounded on the anvil of the Chinese Communist yeah. Revolution, which esteems none of the things that he does. Mm -hmm. And about the story of his this son. This is the, the, the father. The father. Who was here, and then he goes back after the revolution in 1949. Yes, hopefully to thinking that there will be a new China. China. Yeah. And then it's about his son, who then, when the father dies, comes to America too, filled with hope and promise, and, mm -hmm. and has a kind of very complicated time, and goes home. Mm -hmm. and then gets wrapped up in the whole uh, 99, eight, 89 Tenement Square demonstrations. And well, I won't tell you what happens in the end. Yeah. There were many Chinese overseas who did go back to China after 1989. And I'm sorry, after, after 1949, 49. after the revolution. And suffered bitterly. Yeah, yeah. Particularly the ones 
who imagined that they could synthesize something of the East and West mm -hmm. and that the revolution would want them mm -hmm. to bring that synthesis back. Mm -hmm. And it turned out Mao did not want that. He wanted their skills if they were nuclear physicists or something, but not anything else. He did or... not want people who viewed the soul of a human being as somehow having a right to certain independence. Mm -hmm. And thus anybody steeped in something like the music of Bach mm -hmm. or any myriad other things of, of, of Western philosophy or, or, or even literature um, was not welcomed. Mm -hmm. So it was a bitter thing for many Chinese intellectuals who went home uh, after 1949 wanting to build a better, mm -hmm. stronger China but also being sort of ambidextrous in both the East and the West, mm -hmm. because they found they, that part of them that had become Western was not welcome, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. had no place in, in Mao's China. And in fact, ended up in bitter catastrophe yeah. for most of them. Yeah. One of the things that intrigued me in the novel is through both these characters, the father and the son, seeing how they saw America and Americans. And it was one of the things that made me feel that only you could have written it, having spent your whole life trying to bring these two countries together in a way. And that I just felt there was a lot of knowledge and experience of seeing America through Chinese eyes in what you were writing there. Well, you know, it's interesting, China has alternately in different segments of society moving in different directions but alternately um, celebrated America mm -hmm. as the great promise mm -hmm. and reviled it as mm -hmm. the great antichrist and these oscillating pulses of attraction and repulsion are sort of deep in the system mm -hmm. so in a certain sense what I wanted to, to, to kind of play on as a theme was the complexity of China, which it felt very beset upon by the mm -hmm. Western world, the imperialist colonializing world, also deeply admired America. Mm -hmm. But that feeling of admiration was also, uh, uh, made people feel sort of humiliated mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. China was sort of a basket case in the early or 20th century. So it was an incredibly complex relationship. Yeah. And I wanted to sort of, plumb that one, the love you and hate you at the same time, want you but want to push you away, don't know how to, how, how to make the twain meet. And mm -hmm. that I think would be, uh, you know, a simple way to, 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 to look at one important aspect of the Chinese Communist mm -hmm. Revolution. During all these uh, 30, 40 years that you've been, actually now it's 45 years, you've been going back and forth uh, to China. Did you feel the characters in your book sort of building by accretion inside you during that time? Well, you know, it was like bending some pretty brittle metal because I, like you, Adam, I am a inveterate nonfiction writer, mm -hmm. you know, and what you have to do in fiction is show, not tell. Mm -hmm. Your characters have to speak indirectly and I sort of knew what I wanted to say, but to be able to have the characters say it in a way that people would want to read, mm -hmm. which wasn't like a church sermon, took a lot of, a lot of pounding on the metal on the anvil. Mm -hmm. And um, I had to do it over and over. So early on, I mean, the first 15 years, it took me 35 years to write this book. I kind of knew what I wanted to say. And mm -hmm. then I had to kind of let the characters say it in a way that wouldn't bore people. Mm -hmm. I hope. Okay. <laughs> All right. I've got lots more questions, but I think it's time to open it up to uh, the others on this call. I'm just going to put my computer on my lap so <clears throat> I can see you. And to remind you of what Jeff said at the beginning, which is to use that function uh, down at the bottom to raise your virtual hand on the screen if you've got a question. So I would invite you to come in with questions. And I would also invite there are a number of you on this call I know who have actually 
been to China with Orville. And if any of you have anything to contribute in the way of uh, memories from those trips, that might be interesting to hear as well. So uh, fire away. Remind me, Jeff, where the uh, virtual hand thing, it's in the uh, lower, um, is it in the lower left? Where do you raise your virtual hand? Uh, she will find the participant box. Uh, Hannah, do you want to describe this to people? Yeah, you should be able to locate the option to raise your virtual hand either at the lower right hand corner of your screen or if you click into the chat button and then um, click on your name, there will be an option to raise your hand as well. Okay, I see some hands coming up now. Uh, why don't we start with uh, Adam Powell? Hi, Adam. Uh, we need some, okay, now oh, you're unmuted. Hi, Orville, good to see you. Uh, uh, congratulations on your new book. Well, thank uh, you. Um, as you probably know, uh, my father actually met with Cho and Lai, but I was six or seven years old, so I don't remember much of that. But you and I were together in Hong Kong watching the HMS Prince of Wales sail off as the British handed over Hong Kong to the Chinese. Has anything that has happened since then surprised you? Oh my God, Adam, do you have a week? Uh, <laughs> yes. <laughs> I mean, listen, I'll try to make this very succinct. I think all of us who have been following China, and I see a few faces here, Jeff Wasserstrom, Liz Economy, many other colleagues on the screen here, who have also been trying to parse the, the difficult passage of this country, um, you know, felt that uh, for a while we were um, converging. And now I think we'd all universally say we're diverging. That's an incredibly stark change. And that has really surprised me because I think I spent my whole life imagining almost maybe arrogantly that uh, you remember the end of history? And you remember when, when, when uh, uh, everybody thought that it was in, in, ineluctable that China would become more like us that history had a direction. Well, it turned out history didn't have quite as much of a direction as we thought. And, and Xi Jinping came along and, and he's got a whole new version of the Chinese Communist Revolution, which is not our version. So, um, boy, I mean, that's a huge change. And it, it changes the terms of the game utterly and uh, makes it, um, you know, uh, it's a whole new act. Okay, I see another hand up from uh, Gray Davis. Governor, your question. Uh, Orvo, it's great hey, to see Gray. you here. <laughs> you look the same. Oh, well, thank you. you I, not just because you can't see me clearly. I remember many nights with Sherry Brown going to dinner at Frank Fats at 10 o'clock at night. And, I talked uh, to him yesterday for about an hour. Oh, fantastic. So I think you may have partially answered my question, but um, so here's this country with more than a billion people uh, and lots of vital resources. I mean, they control about 70% uh, of the lithium in the world. Uh, I think somewhere along the line of 90% of all the reagents and products that are necessary to make generic drugs are in China. I seemed earlier last year that uh, all the PPE was in China. So it's hard to ignore them. Um, what, what, if you were Secretary of State, oh, and to say nothing of their insisting that all our uh, social media companies and others share their, share their intellectual property as a condition for operating in China. Uh, if you were Secretary of State, what would you advise as the policy this country should pr uh, pursue with China? Well, that's a good question, Gray. And, you know, Adam and I were just talking about this. Actually, I think, and we're only a few months into it, but I think, uh, you know, Biden has it pretty right so far that China is heading in a direction which is a direct challenge to almost everything that we believe in, whether it's capitalism, democracy, the way the world is put together, uh, you name it. And this really, really is a challenge. Uh, how, do we, how do we confront that? And I think the best way to confront it 
is to be a better democracy, to be a better capitalist system, to, to, to do what we used to think we could do much better than we have been doing it. That's, that's the antidote. But I think it's China, what is so sort of alarming to me about it is that it is an autocratic form of government attached to a successful economic system. And that makes it very compelling and very uh, uh, convincing to, to other countries. And I think we've, we're a little off our game right now. Uh, Jeff Wasserstrom, I see you had your hand up, but you took it down. I don't know whether that means your question was answered or whether you still have one. I think you're muted. Uh, but I think they have to unmute oh, him from, oh, okay. oh, there, you, there you go. Yeah, no, I just had a, I just had a flip comment when you said, Adam, that Orville was always gone when you were uh, a, a classmate of his. I was, I started graduate school at Berkeley in 1984 and was very intimidated by one of the students in the class being Orville Schell, who I'd been yeah, reading please. for years. <laughs> um, so I was worried about, you know, making a presentation, Orville there, being there to comment on it. But he wasn't there because he was off on the Yangtze leading a river cruise by the time we were partway into the, into the semester. But it was, it was pretty extraordinary to be able to have him as a classmate briefly. And I did get to see him in China once. He came over in 1987. I was in Shanghai, and that was right after. Oh, I remember that. The sort of warm-up protests to the Tiananmen ones had taken place. That so was very memorable. We had um, we had dinner together and talked about um, yeah what what had just happened and whether there would be any more protests like that. And I think just in terms of predictions, neither of us was saying, but nobody was saying, just wait two years and then they'll really things will really explode. We knew there'd be more protests, but time and again things happen that um, that take us back, even, even knowing as much as anybody does. Well, I'd have to say, Jeff, you know, um, the notion of expertise when it comes to China is highly overrated uh, because in actuality, China continues to be such an unresolved contradiction that it acts out of either side of the contradiction at different times in such a convincing manner that you think that's what it is. But inherent within it is still the other side of the contradiction. I mean, I remember when I went to China in 1976 and Mao was still alive and I was out in the Dajai People's uh, Brigade, you know, toiling with the broad masses of the, of the people. Um, I thought this was it. This was China. This was eternity. And a couple of years later, it wasn't. So I, I think uh, none of us, have imagined any of the big turns that China has made, except to say that all were possible, but nobody could predict them. And I wager that, that, that Xi Jinping is not the end of it. And uh, it constantly sort of expresses its opposite in ways which are surprising. It just takes time. Uh, Shang Mei, I see you have your hand up. Yes, hi. Uh, first of all, Orville, congratulations on this book. I know Bai Tong is very, very proud of you. Um, so congratulations. Now, I, I look forward to reading the book. I haven't read the whole thing yet, but I'm sure it talked about lives being pulled apart um, during the past decades. And I'm wondering if you could share your view on the current situation, the impact of decoupling on businesses and families that are built on a foundation of a cross-cultural foundation. What yeah, I mean, listen, I'm sure you share the sentiment of having spent decades uh, hoping that the notion of convergence, even though it was slow, was both ineluctable and, and going to continue. Uh, you must feel incredibly sad and, 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 and confused by what's been going on of late with Xi Jinping, which is not uh, bringing the two countries closer together. But Xi Jinping is actually pioneering a whole new model, which is sort of authoritarian capitalism. Mm -hmm. And, you know, 
uh, where is that going to go? Boy, I don't know, but I find it pretty frightening because I think that there's a kind of a militance reinstalled within the Chinese Communist Party that I hadn't seen since Mao was alive. And I don't think there's an awful lot of flex in the system. And so in a terrifying way for me, we are in a systemic rivalry again. It's not just economic systems. It's not so much economic systems. It's political systems. And at the same time, America has sort of weakened itself and become rather, uh, rather fractured and not such a good exemplar of the very thing we would like to, uh, to, to display as the alternative to the Chinese model, which economically has been quite successful. So I think we're, we're in a very, very parlous, difficult time. Speaking of America being a model, have you heard anything from Chinese friends about how they reacted to what happened at the Capitol on January 6th? I think Chinese are, are as confused as we are. Uh, I, I think they, and on the one hand, they don't mind seeing America, those people who are diehard, you know, patriots and love the party, uh, sort of come a cropper and tear mm -hmm. itself apart. On the other hand, there's an awful lot of Chinese who still really do admire America. And even though if they might not always agree with what, what, what we do, I think it's a pretty terrifying prospect for them to see what they had assumed was a viable political proposition, mm -hmm. tearing itself apart almost like the Chinese did with Mao. Mm -hmm. You know, to risk throwing away a system that was quite confirmed here, not so in China when the communists came in. But I, I do think it's, it's created a tremendous sense among some Chinese of exhilaration that America has feet of clay, mm -hmm. but also fright mm -hmm. that what they thought was the a permanent land structure, you know, land form, American democracy is actually so imperiled. Mm -hmm. Okay, more questions. I see lots of hands up here. Uh, Eric uh, Hakela, you've had your hand up for a while. Uh, question from you. Uh, can he be on? Wait a minute, he's okay. There he is. Oh, yes. Do it again. So, thank you to Jeff and Eileen for organizing this, and congratulations, Orville Schell, on this new book. I've long thought that uh, in some ways, fiction does can be more truth than nonfiction, speak more truth than nonfiction. And your comments seem to echo that. I'm wondering whether there are any fiction, works of fiction coming out of China, uh, either currently or in, in years past that influenced your thinking about how to approach the writing of this work? That's an interesting question. Um, there are some things. There's one writer I just adore who uh, died in 1936. Uh, his name is Lu Xun. And um, I, I adore him because he, he could deal with ambiguity. Mm -hmm. And he wasn't sort of on one side or the other. He was racked with, you know, uncertainty about how to proceed, but he was a deeply moral writer. Do you see anyone in China today who's, who has inherited Lu Xun's uh, mantle? I think there are some people. The tragedy is that as soon as someone inherits a mantle that has any integrity and truthfulness, they're driven out of the tent in China and they're put into exile. We're very often like some flower out of water. They just wilt because they're after all Chinese and most of the people who would be interested in what they have to say are in China. So there's a kind of a very sad process that happens both to writers and artists and even musicians and political people that they get spat out. And the Chinese Communist Party is very smart about it. Once that you get spat out, you get spun off into exile. You have a shelf life of a year maybe when people might pay attention to you. And then you just shrivel and nobody, nobody bothers with you anymore. You know, maybe I'm struck by what you said about uh, this writer not being afraid of ambiguity. 
maybe that's a major difference between fiction and, 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 and nonfiction, because in fiction, uh, you don't want to be too declarative. Uh, something can have many meanings, and people still argue about the meanings of, of uh, great novels, whereas a tolerance for ambiguity doesn't get you too far if you're writing a column for the New York Times. You can't begin by saying, I'm not sure what our policy towards China yeah. should be. Or it doesn't get you too far writing a column for the People's Daily. Yeah, that's uh, true. Yeah, I mean, you, Adam, have spent a lot of time in Russia and written about Russia. I mean, this is one of the this is one of the great sort of uh, sicknesses of, of of a communist system mm -hmm. that it really doesn't allow for tremendous amounts of ambiguity or truthfulness, for that matter. So, um, yeah. Okay. More questions crowding in here. Uh, Steve Schlesinger. Fire away. Good to see you, Steve. Uh, can we unmute him? It'll be a second. I'm mute. Can there you hear you me are. now? Yes. Okay. <laughs> Hi, Adam. Uh, I, I want to say one thing that I was delighted to hear that John Fairbank was one of your professors. He happens to be my, be my, an uncle of mine by marriage, and he was he was a great man. Um, mm -hmm. In any case, I, I thought it was sort of amusing that. For a time there, uh, many of the Chinese dissidents thought Donald Trump was terrific. They thought he was going to really push the Chinese government on human rights and somehow destabilize the regime. Uh, it, how do you explain that? And do they continue? Will they continue to feel that about Biden and his administration? Well, that's an interesting question. I mean, um, uh, I mean, early on, Trump did talk with, uh, you know, the president of Taiwan. And I mean, Trump uh, was, was a man who was very contradictory. Uh, but they hoped that, that, that he would sort of evince a, a firmer anti-communism. It turned out that he was a bit wishy-washy and uh, I think uh, things got clouded very, very quickly. Um, as to Biden, I think he's been rather surprising to people that he's been pretty firm. And uh, I think he's a sensible man, but I think he realizes that things have changed and the old hopes of engagement have really been just eviscerated by what Xi Jinping has done. And that there is very little, little margin now to actually have constructive discussions with, with the Chinese Communist Party, which doesn't mean we shouldn't try. and doesn't mean this isn't probably the most important relationship to work out, because the last thing we want to do is to go to war. But it just means that right now, uh, you know, Xi Jinping has a kind of a notion that he's on a roll economically. And I think everything is going to turn on that. And everything will turn on whether the United States can get its act together and get on an economic roll itself after the pandemic. And then we'll see. But we are in, in my view, something not a, totally analogous to the Cold War, but perhaps more dangerous because China has economic power, which Russia did not have. And it's gaining military power. Uh, David Fenton. Hi, Orville. Hi, Adam. Um, Orville, uh, do you think there's a prospect for some cooperation now between the China and the United States on climate survival? I do. And I think this is one of the areas that I am most eager to do whatever I can to facilitate. And there are, I mean, there are very few areas where I think I can be hopeful. Climate would be one of them. But I would have thought also a pandemic would have been one of them. Because if there ever was a commons, a pandemic is equally as much a commons as is, um, as is climate. Uh, but the Chinese have done some pretty interesting things vis-a-vis -vis climate, not, not a completely good, clean slate. But I do hope, and we now have John Kerry minding this store on the American side, so I do hope that we can collaborate. However, there is a long history within China of holding one issue hostage to another. Mm -hmm. 
And I, I'm watching very carefully to see if Xi Jinping and the Chinese Communist Party is capable of treating certain issues as so important that something the way the Soviet Union did, you know, we could have a Helsinki Accord, we actually could come to terms on some issues, even as though we vociferously disagree. And perhaps even are, are risking some sort of possibility of military clash in other areas. But I have to say, I think Biden could do this. I'm not sure the Chinese Communist Party can. Uh, John Shattuck and Ellen Hume, you are folks who uh, have experience living in a country that's authoritarian, capitalist, Hungary. And I'd be curious to hear what your questions are. Hi, John. <laughs> Hi, Orbelin, and, and it's very good to see you. Thank you so much um, for your book and for your presence and your thoughts. Um, I guess our question, and I think I haven't rehearsed this with Alan, so perhaps <laughs> she will disagree with me, but I, I would like to get your advice, Orville. Um, you gave me advice many years ago when I went into the US government and the Clinton administration on human rights in China and how the US government should approach that topic. Obviously, <laughs> The situation today, as we've been discussing, and is so clear, is so fundamentally different, and the and the stakes are are higher in many ways. But so are the catastrophes for human rights. And if you look at the situation facing the Uyghurs uh, in Xinjiang, and the situation in Hong Kong, or any number of other specific topics that we could raise, what would your advice be to Joe Biden on how to address? the issues of human rights, or should they simply be pushed aside in the bilateral context? No, I, th I think we've sort of, in effect, tried versions of, uh, if not pushing them aside, of at least not making them so ascendant that they eclipse our ability to do other things. But I do think that we're reaching a point now where China is actually relatively successfully, although there are a lot of weaknesses, affecting a whole new model which is an, uh, 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 an authoritarianism of a highly evolved model connected to a kind of a quasi-marketized system that's quite successful. So this poses a lot of challenges to us. And I think the best thing we can do is to get our own democracy functional. And to, uh, as I think Biden has started to do, to weave a fabric of other like-minded democratic countries such as they're, you know, uh, just often in, in Japan and Korea, um, uh, the, you know, in the last few days, and now meeting with the Chinese in Alaska. Uh, I think this is this is right. But I do think that the, the key thing is to heal ourselves and make our own democracy as functional as we can, which is going to be a tough road to hoe, given what we've just been through. And then uh, try to uh, bring together Australia, India. Well, we already have the quad, but make the quad credible and make our ability in the world to be democratically effective and successful and, and, and credible uh, uh, real again. Um, in the chat, Sewell Chan has a, a question that, that goes to an interesting and different dimension than what we've been talking about so far. Could the emerging bipartisan consensus on China be paradoxically a force that reduces polarization and brings our parties together? Just as Cold War imperatives were one reason our politics were relatively moderate and consensual in the middle of the 20th century. Well, so that's a, that's a great question. That really goes to the heart of the future, doesn't it? Um, you know, when you look at what's going on in, in Washington, where the Republicans and the Democrats agree about nothing uh, except about China. And there is a growing consensus that China is uh, a, a, an increasing threat and that we need to converge with allies. Uh, that's the best remedy to its challenge. And I, I agree with that. So I think that, uh, you know, um, that is the best remedy, and I think Biden understands that. Uh, it's very interesting how, I mean, the number of countries that China's alienated lately, India, 
-hmm. Australia, I mean, Sweden, Norway. I mean, uh, um, it's quite extraordinary what a bad job they've done in selling themselves, mm -hmm. but they still have enormous economic clout. Interesting. Uh, Rob Johnson, you've had your hand up for quite a while. Yes, uh, two things. Uh, Orville is my neighbor in Bolinas. Hi, Rob. I want to pay tribute to your belated wife, Bai Feng, who was a delight. And as you know, the two of you helped me a great deal in my navigations in China for the Institute for New Economic Thinking. I just wanted to acknowledge the beauty of her life and my condolences to you. Thank you, Rob. Secondly, your book on wealth and power creates a beautiful portrait of the scar tissue associated with the opium war and the Japanese invasion of China on the one hand, and what you might call the egotism of the leader of empire in the United States on the other. So that the, the dice are loaded for this conflict. And the question I wanna ask is when I talk to people like you and my friend at Tsinghua University, Wang Hui, he says, Robert, people ask us to emulate American democracy but look at the dissatisfaction in the public opinion polls of Western democracies, whether Germany or Sweden or the UK or particularly the United States. How can we overcome what we might call plutocratic authoritarianism in America to create a broader base prosperity, which becomes a magnet for the world to migrate in our direction rather than be in this stalemate between these two powers with their own scar tissue driving distance between us. And finally, you've done a tremendous amount of work on climate change with Governor Brown and with the Chinese. We all need these two countries to work together or we will not overcome this challenge. Give us some guidance as to how you see us going forward in that realm, please. Yeah, I mean, we inescapably live in the same planet. And that is one of the things that makes controversy and possible conflict with China so unthinkable. And climate change for me is probably the greatest threat for both countries. I think when I look at China's progress in the question of climate change over the past few decades, I see a substantial amount, but still not complete. Uh, and of course, under Trump, there was no recognition of it at all. Under Biden, that's different. So I mean, there are places where we could and should get together. And climate change is certainly one of them. And I think the Chinese do recognize that. But on the other hand, I have to say that I, you know, all of my years trying to parse China and make sense out of it, they can be very totalistic. And, you know, it's sometimes, sometimes they can be very practical, but other times they can be very militantly totalistic and say, we're not gonna cooperate with you on anything because X, Y, and Z are uh, out of sorts. Uh, it remains to be seen whether uh, Xi Jinping and, and Biden can find a point of convergence on this important question. I hope they do. That's the challenge of diplomacy. So we're, we're at the hour mark. So I wanna just have a couple more questions and then um, I'm afraid we're gonna to have to stop. Uh, Mark Danner. Mark needs to be- I think you have to unmute. Well, they need to unmute him, but his screen says Michelle. No, but that's so how they can find him. Can you guys find him? To un there you go. Okay. Thanks, Adam. Um, it's great to be here, and it's wonderful to celebrate this extraordinary uh, book. Uh, my question was actually asked quite a while ago, very eloquently, by John Shattuck. So I, I, I'm going to take the liberty of reminiscing just a little bit, um, because in reading this book, 
uh, even though we've stressed disjunction today, that is that this is Orville's first effort at fiction. It's different from his scholarly endeavors. When I'm, I read it, I think, my God, this is kind of the grand climax of a life spent trying to get one side to understand the other. And it's an epic journey in this effort to get one culture so different from the other uh, to understand it. And I'm just reminded of uh, visiting China, I don't know, it was about a decade ago with Orville and his so-called cultural SWAT team in which he brought uh, Meryl Streep and Yo-Yo Ma and Joel Cohen and uh, Alice Waters and about 15 other people on a cultural mission to Beijing. And I uh, have to thank him for my whole life of having the experience of interviewing Meryl Streep in front of the Beijing Young Woman's Meryl Streep fan club who were this you know, group of about 40 teeny boppers wearing acid yellow hoodies with Meryl written across their chests in glitter, screaming and yelling. And I thought this is my supreme cross-cultural experience with China of my life. And I also remember from that trip, Orville standing boldly in the National Theater of China, the gorgeous egg, um, addressing this crowd, which consisted mainly of party poobahs uh, in Chinese, and the young woman next to me giggling, and I said, why are you giggling? She said, he is so cute when he speaks Chinese, she said to me. Um, during that gathering That's my also- my specialty, Mark. Yeah. <laughs> he was a teeny bopper uh, celebrity, and during that session also, I remember uh, Yo-Yo Ma playing uh, his cello and uh, Meryl Streep kowtowing to him on the floor. Um, this, again, an amazing cross-cultural moment. And I remember thinking at that moment that this sort of massive cultural exchange uh, with this kind of creative grouping of rappers and painters and writers and artists and chefs uh, on both sides could simply only be put together in all the 8 billion people on the face of the earth by Orville Schell. It just, there just would have been nobody else who could have done it. So my excuse for a question at the end of this is, could you do something like that now? And if the answer is no, what was it about that moment that allowed this moment of openness between the two cultures? Well, it's an interesting question, Mark. I mean, China does wax and wane in its receptivity towards the outside world and in its relaxing and flexing its Leninist muscles. And alas, we are now in a phase of flexing its Leninist muscles and uh, truncating the kinds of exchanges we had back then with the outside world. So I think it's probably not possible, certainly not for me. Uh, but I think really for anybody. And that's part of the great challenge of how do you get along with a country that is an economic powerhouse where the musculature that enables it to interact in a healthy way with the outside world and other countries is atrophied, is atrophied by the party's refusal to exercise those muscles. So I think we are actually, and one reason I wrote this book was because I think we're, I mean, we are really in a heading in the wrong direction in a very dangerous state where we don't really even know how to talk to each other anymore. I'm going to allow one last question, and I want to take it from the chat because it's someone asking about what we're really talking about here, which is to celebrate your novel and your uh, switch from nonfiction to fiction. Uh, although, of course, you're still entitled to write nonfiction again. Thank I, you. I know you're already working on something here. This question comes in the chat from Philippa Kelly, who says, Orville, as a dramaturge, I would love to know whether your working patterns are similar writing fiction to the work habits you have in writing your nonfiction works. Yeah, interesting question. I'll tell you. If you look in the back of the book, you will see a long list of people, and Adam Hochschild and Arlie Hochschild are among them, who I turn to, because to bend the metal of nonfiction writing to fiction writing 
is takes a contortionist. Mm. And it was it took me 30 years. I knew what I wanted to say, but I was not didn't have the chops, the skills, the ability to say it in that other idiom of nonfiction, of, of fiction, excuse me. So that was really, really hard. But I'm glad I, I did try. You all have to be a judge if you can stand to read 601 pages, uh, whether I've succeeded. But I just felt I'd gotten to the point where there were too many things that I couldn't explain didactically, mm -hmm. that I had to show uh, and not tell. And so that's what kept driving me on. I mean, there were many points where I thought, this is insane. I can't do this. I don't know how to do this. I'm just going to throw it up. Mm -hmm. But thanks to people like Adam, who wallowed through early versions of it, <laughs> it slowly evolved into whatever it is today. And uh, if you read it, I'd be very curious to get your Well, response. don't don't put yourself down by saying things like that. This is a deeply absorbing book. And as you can see from the pre-publication reviews, uh, some of which excerpts of which were in the invitation to this, this event, many, many people have found it deeply moving. and. Those of you who haven't read it yet, I would urge you to do so. Well, that's a promotion that only a friend of <laughs> 65 years could give. So thank you, Adam. So I think we've got to bring this to an end, but I thank you all for coming. Uh, urge you to read Orville's book, and we really appreciate your being with us. Well, thanks, Adam. It's great. It's really nice we could do this together. Thanks, Jeff, too, who is an, also a friend since age six or seven, if you can believe yeah. it. So we have a den of thieves who've been in, the, in, in, in a cabal for many decades here tonight. So thank you, Jeff, uh, for arranging all this. Take care, everybody. Thanks to all of you for, Stay for joining safe. us.